Well, today we're in part three of my series, Five Things You Can't Do Without. For review, two weeks ago, we looked at uh, You Can't Do Without Faith because Hebrews 11:6 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. There's a booklet on the table in the lobby on that sermon. Last Sunday it was You Can't Do Without Works because James 2 26 says, faith without works is dead. Here's the booklet if you missed it or if you want to read it again or whatever, here it is. Today is part number three. You can't do without the blood of Christ because Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Next Sunday, we'll be studying how you can't do without holiness because Hebrews 12.14 says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And then our fifth and final Sunday is you can't do without Jesus because Jesus said, without me you can do nothing in John 15, 5. So today then, we're looking at part three, you can't do without the blood of Christ. Deep within the heart of every human is a sense of failure. No one has lived up to God's laws perfectly. We haven't even lived up to our own rules, much less God's. Experience has taught us that we hurt only ourselves when we disobey God. We don't really break God's commandments as much as they break us. We have failed God and ourselves. We crave forgiveness, and until we have it, we're unhappy and unfulfilled. There's no one as miserable as a person who realizes he or she isn't right with God. And that's why the gospel is good news. It announces that forgiveness is available to everyone. No matter how sinful we are, God is eager to forgive us. But he doesn't automatically cancel our sins. There's only one work that wins our forgiveness, And that's the work of Christ on the cross. When he died for our sins, Jesus purchased our pardon by shedding his blood. Our verse today is Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Robert Lowry wrote of this in his hymn, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Many hospitals include a blood bank, a place where donations of blood have been stored and will be used later for blood transfusions. God built the first blood bank. You can find it on a hill called Calvary, where Jesus was nailed to a cross. He suffered, bled, and died. God's blood bank contains an unlimited supply of the precious blood of the Son of God. Jesus' blood matches every type, contains no viruses, washes away every sin, and is free to everyone who will trust in it. Here's my first point this morning, examples of this truth from Scripture. I'll give you three examples from the Bible of our central truth today. The first example is Adam and Eve. After Adam and Eve sinned and discovered (coughs) their nakedness, they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves up. They knew they weren't presentable to God, so they tried to hide their guilt by covering themselves with fig leaves. But God refused to accept their efforts to dress themselves up before him. He clothed Adam and Eve in animal skins, and to do that, he had to kill the animals. All of this is in Genesis chapter 3. The lesson came home to Adam and Eve that their sin required the shedding of blood. Without it, they couldn't be presentable to God. Curiously, when Jesus walked this earth, the only thing he ever cursed was a fig tree. I think Jesus meant to show us 
that God's curse rests on all our efforts to repeat the mistake of Adam and Eve by trying to win God's forgiveness by methods we invent. Today, our fig leaves are all our attempts to get God to forgive us apart from placing our faith in the shed blood of the crucified Savior, Jesus. Here's a second example, the Passover. On the night when God was going to liberate his people from Egyptian slavery, he warned the Jews that he was also going to kill the firstborn in every home in Egypt. He instructed the Jews to smear blood on the doors of their houses, and when he saw the blood, he would pass over their homes and the firstborn children would be untouched by his judgment. The, the Egyptians paid no attention to what Israel did, and that night they paid for it with the death of their firstborn, while every Jewish child was spared. And so the shedding of blood meant safety for Israel. And today it still means spiritual safety for us who trust in Christ's death on the cross where his blood was shed. Today the Passover takes place all over again. When God sees our faith in the blood of Christ and his judgment passes over us. And then the third example is the Last Supper. On the night of his arrest, our Lord celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. There he told them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Our remembrance of Christ in communion is a reminder to us that Jesus had to shed his blood for sins to be forgiven. Every time we swallow the contents of the cup, we're saying, I believe in the power of Christ's blood to make me right with God. And so the lesson comes home again. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now my second point today is examples of this truth from the world. The first example is pagan religions. Why is it that even pagan religions have altars on which animals are slain? Because deep in their hearts, something tells them their sins can't be forgiven without the shedding of blood. In the Old Testament, we read of how heathen parents would sacrifice their children on an altar because they were convinced that blood had to be shed for their sins to be forgiven. Their mistake was in thinking that the shed blood had to come from their own children. They never stopped to think that God had a son who would shed his blood to wash their sins away. Why do countless Muslims crawl to the city of Mecca as a religious ritual? because they suppose that their bloody knees will move the heart of God to excuse them for their sins. But mere human blood can't remove the stain. Only the blood of the Son of God can do that. Example number two. People who attend church thinking that may win God's forgiveness. When people attend church to win God's approval or when they donate money to the offering to buy God's approval, their acts are not the shedding of blood, but are still sacrificial in the minds of the people. And they hope that these acts will make up for their guilt. The principle is correct, but the manner of fulfillment is wrong. Only the blood sacrifice of Jesus can take away our sins. And then the third example from the world is war. Even war teaches that blood must be spilled for wrongs to be made right. In the 1970s, millions 
of red Chinese youth were in the news as they marched down the streets of Peking chanting a statement that in English meant, without the shedding of blood, there is no revolution. So then, the truth of Hebrews 9.22 is taught everywhere we look, whether inside or outside of the Bible. That blood must be spilled for our sins to be forgiven is a self-evident law that people know almost instinctively. My third point today is lessons from this truth. What does all of this mean to us personally? What practical lessons can we apply to our lives from this truth that forgiveness cannot be ours apart from the shedding of the Savior's blood? Well, lesson number one is no amount of good works can earn your salvation. You can't be saved by your perfect life because you're far from perfect. And you can't be saved by your imperfect life because God won't accept that. The only solution to your sin problem is the blood that Jesus shed for you. Just maybe you grew up in a home and your father sent you the message, maybe not in words, but you, you got the message that he wasn't going to love you, he wasn't going to praise you, he wasn't going to be proud of you unless you became successful. And so you made it your big goal in life to be successful. You wanted to earn your dad's respect and blessing and, and love. And you did a lot of things, and, but despite all your good efforts and your successes, for some reason, he still never praised you, never was proud of you, never loved you. And maybe it was because you still didn't measure up to his standards. Well, the good news is that the Heavenly Father is not like that. He loves you unconditionally. You all know who Bill Gates is, the main founder of Microsoft. I read about him in Wikipedia, and it says that he has already donated $28 billion to charity, and for the rest of his life, he's going to give away 95% of every dollar he's ever earned to charity. Guess what? God loves Bill Gates. But God doesn't love Bill Gates because of the billions of dollars he's given because God loves everybody. God loves people who've never worked a day in their lives, people who cheat on their income taxes, people who are sponges off society, just as much as he loves Bill Gates why? Because God's love does not, is not based on our accomplishments or lack of them. Two people really known for their good works were Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. Billy Graham preached the gospel to more than a million people. Mother Teresa spent her life ministering to people with AIDS and leprosy. She set up soup kitchens. She founded schools and orphanages. Her motto in life was to give wholehearted and free service to the poorest of the poor. But I want to tell you, Bill, Billy Graham and Mother Teresa are in heaven today not because of all those good works that they did. And they would be the first people to tell you that. They would tell you that they were imperfect people who needed the blood of Jesus to wash away their sins. Imagine a fish caught on a hook. It struggles to get loose, squirming one way and then the next. But despite squirming every which way, it's never able to free itself from the hook. P. 
People who try to earn their salvation by doing good works are like that fish. They make an all-out effort to please God by doing countless things, but all it gets them is exhaustion. They never get off the hook that way. Only Jesus can take them off the hook. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You and I could cry a river of tears in sorrow for the way we've displeased God, but even our tears and our promises to do better cannot earn God's forgiveness. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now here's a second practical lesson we can learn from this truth. Everyone is on the same level. The pastor of a 30,000 member megachurch gets into heaven the same way as the man who feels unworthy and ashamed to set foot in a tiny church out in the country. The president of a bank must humble herself under Christ's blood and all it represents as much as a welfare recipient. The debutante who is welcomed into high society can't be a Christian at all unless she comes to the cross of Jesus and stands under his blood just like the unattractive and unpopular girl back at school she calls a loser. If sophisticated country club members are going to become children of God, it must be through, the sa through faith in the same of blood of Christ that the murderer on death row trusts in. If self-righteous religious leaders are ever going to be saved from their sins, they must humble themselves under the blood of Christ the same way the rapist does over whom they stand in judgment. Everyone is on the same level because we're all sinners. And without the shedding of Christ's blood, there is no forgiveness for any sinner under any circumstance. Worldly credentials don't count for anything with God. Each of us must go to the cross and personally trust in the work Jesus accomplished for us. Then, and only then, can we be forgiven. Lesson number three, your forgiveness is costly. When God saw us lost in sin, he wasn't able to say, I love you so much, I'll just look all, overlook all the bad things you've done. No, sin had been committed and therefore the punishment had to be paid. Our sins were so great that there was no amount of money that could have paid the penalty. God's law demanded capital punishment. If God had condemned you and me to hell forever, justice would have been served. Fortunately for us, God took another path. He sent his only son to endure the punishment we deserved, and that punishment took place when Jesus was nailed to his cross. The Heavenly Father didn't enjoy watching sinful men murder his sinless son, nor did he enjoy pouring out his own judgment down on Jesus, who was paying the penalty for our sins in his body on the cross. But God loved us and wanted so much to forgive us that he went ahead with the cross anyway. And thus we see how costly our forgiveness is with, to God. Have you ever been hurt so deeply that you felt you could never forgive that person? Here is Charles Colson's book, Who Speaks for God? And in it, he tells the story of the murder of Adolf Coors III. Now, yes, this is the same 
Adolf Kors and as in the family, you know, the beer, Kors beer family. Let me read the story here out of this book. On February 9th, 1960, Adolf Kors III was kidnapped. Seven months later, his body was found. He had been shot to death. He left behind a 15-year-old son, Adolf Kors IV. A suspect, Joseph Corbett, was caught, tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. Young Ad Kors lived with hatred for the man who had murdered his father. Then, in 1975, Ad became a Christian. Dale Morris, a friend and fellow believer, asked Ad if he had ever forgiven his father's murderer. Ad hesitated, then replied, Sure, Dale, in my heart. Dale then took it a step further. Have you ever visited Corbett, told him you forgive him, and asked him to forgive you for hating him? Dale then informed Ad that as part of Charles Colson's prison fellowship, he was going the following week to the Cannon City Prison where Corbett was confined. Dale invited Ad to go with him. That invitation hit me right in the pit of my stomach, Ad remembered. He accepted, and the next week they visited the prison along with a team from Prison Fellowship. But Corbett refused to be visited. So Ad left him a Bible and wrote in it, As a Christian, I have been commanded by Jesus Christ to ask for your forgiveness. I forgive you for the sins you have committed against my family, and I ask you to forgive me for hating you. At the rally that day, Ad explained, Hatred is like the barrel of a shotgun that's plugged. Pretty soon it's going to go off in your face. It hurts the hater more than the hated. It ate me alive, and it ate my family alive. Tonight I have a love for that man that only Jesus Christ could have put in my heart. Boy, that's a powerful testimony, isn't it? <clears throat> now, if Jesus could quench Adolf Kors' hatred, don't you think he can extinguish yours? The essence of hatred is that it uses other people for selfish ends as if they were inhuman objects. Just think what it cost Adolf Kors to forgive his enemy. He paid for it in heartache, anxiety, gray hairs, premature aging, and who knows what else. Yet he was willing to give all that up to see his worst enemy forgiven. It cost God his only son to forgive us. It cost Jesus his life's blood. So how can we take sin lightly? Now for lesson number four. Forgiveness is possible. Many people feel unforgivable. These people understand that sins aren't forgiven easily, but they struggle to grasp by faith the good news that Christ has died, his blood has been shed, and they can be forgiven. <clears throat> Someone has described it this way. Sins against a holy God, sins against his righteous laws, sins against his love, his blood, sins against his name and cause, sins immense as is the sea, from them all the blood cleanses me. Forgiveness is what you and I want most of all. We can do without money, social standing, a job, if only we can be right with God. Since forgiveness is possible, make sure you don't miss it. If you haven't yet received God's forgiveness by trusting in Jesus' death on the cross, then gather up all your sins and 
Place them under Jesus as he dies on the cross and watch his spilled blood wash all your sins away. I can't think of any greater tragedy than to miss out on God's free forgiveness in Christ. Don't let that happen to you. Lesson number five, you can be sure of your salvation. Because salvation depends on Christ's work on the cross, you don't have to worry about losing it. If God required you to earn his favor, you'd never know when you had done enough and your right standing with God would always be in danger. But God doesn't require you to earn his forgiveness. He even forbids you to try. God promises you forgiveness if you'll trust in his son's shed blood and you can feel secure in that. If I were trying to earn God's forgiveness by my good works, I'll tell you, I would be a nervous wreck. I'd be full of fear that I hadn't done enough. Or <clears throat> if I thought I had done enough, the next day I might commit a sin that would make me wonder if I had lost God's favor. Peace with God comes from knowing that Jesus' work on the cross will always be good enough for the Father. Here's the biography of Ray Steadman, a very famous pastor. Uh, I'm happy to say that when I began my ministry as a pastor at age uh, 25 years old, he was a prayer partner to me. I met with him and prayed together. But any, anyway, let me read to you the story. The biographer quotes Ray Steadman himself when, when he was a college student. And the whole idea of the assurance of his salvation came home to his heart. Listen to this. I shall never forget the day when that truth burst upon me in all its fullness. How vividly it all comes back to me. The joy, the unhindered joy that filled my heart as, lying on my bed in my room, it dawned upon me that if anything happened to me, I had nothing to fear in the future. I was forgiven. God had already judged me in Christ, and I was forgiven, set free. Oh, the joy of this great fundamental truth of the Christian faith, that in Jesus Christ and his work for us, God had taken away my sin. Yeah, all of us can feel that way because of uh, that our salvation depends on the blood of Christ and not on our faithfulness. And then one more lesson, it's this. You need to forgive others. Bahram de Khan Dekanai Taftai was 25 years old when Iranian government agents murdered him because he was a Christian. His father is also a Christian, and here in this issue of Decision Magazine, this goes back to 2003, anyway, uh, they quote his father's prayer at his son's funeral service, okay? So this is the father of the young man whose funeral is being conducted. And listen to this prayer. O oh God, we remember not only our son, but also his murderers. Not because they killed him in the prime of his youth and made our hearts bleed and tears flow, but because through their crime, we now follow your footsteps more closely in the way of sacrifice. It makes obvious, as never before, our need to trust in your love as shown in the cross of Jesus. Love that makes us free from hate toward our persecutors. 
Love that more than ever deepens our trust in your final victory. Love that teaches us how to prepare ourselves to face our own final day of death. Boy, that is profound right there. Okay, I'm going to close by reading. Th this is a book I wrote, 40 Days to Fall in Love with Your Bible. And on one of the days, I talk about forgiveness. And at the end of that chapter, I uh, quote this poem with a one-word title, and the title is Forgiven. And, you know, that's what we've been talking about all morning here. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So I'm going to end with a poem about forgiveness. Not far from New York is a cemetery lone. Close guarding its grave stands a simple headstone, and all its inscription is one word alone, forgiven. No sculptor's fine art has embellished its form, but constantly there through the calm and the storm, it bears this word that will make your heart warm. Forgiven. The death is unmentioned. The name is untold. Beneath lies the body, corrupted and cold. Above rests his spirit, at home in the fold, forgiven. And when from the heavens the Lord shall descend, this stranger shall rise into glorious end, well known and befriended, befriend, friended, so sing without end, forgiven. If you have your trust today in the blood of Jesus and you have the assurance that God has forgiven you, say, forgiven right now. Forgiven. Amen. Father, may this be our song in time and eternity, singing without end, forgiven. Thank you for the blood of Christ that washes away all our sins. Thank you that we don't have to depend on ourselves to be good enough. But we trust in Christ who was sinless and perfect, the spotless Lamb of God who shed his blood and takes away the sin of the world. Thank you for sacrificing yourself for us, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for sacrificing your Son for us and so proving your love. We praise you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.